Hey, welcome to today's um, live broadcast. This is the final episode in our journey, or on our journey, <laughs> going from minor to major, and we've been tracking the life of Joseph. Yes, Joseph the dreamer in the Bible. Um, we've been looking at how God took him from minor to major, and um, the different stages, what happened, and so on and so forth. So today's part 12 and final part, okay? So today we're going to um, scan through um, chapters 40. Well, we're going to start from chapter 45, from verse 21. And we're going to go right down to chapter 50. We're not reading everything, so don't be scared. <laughs> we're only going to look at, you know, specific things that we want to highlight in uh, Joseph's life as he you know, um, finished what God called him to do at his major um, point in Egypt. Okay, so um, yesterday's episode, we finished off by saying that um, we called it minor shows up at ma uh, Joseph's major. You know, how that in the fullness of time, God connected him with his uh, siblings, you know, and so on and so forth. And uh, so we're going to take it from Genesis 45 and verses, I'm going to read verses 21 to 28, so we can just round that bit up, okay? So, so the sons of Israel did this, the sons of Jacob. Joseph gave them carts as Pharaoh had commanded, and he also gave them provisions for their journey. To each of them, he gave new clothing, but to Benjamin, he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. <laughs> And this is what he sent to his father. Ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his journey. Then he sent his brothers away and as they were leaving, he said to them, don't quarrel on the way. Verse 25. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is a ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. Remember, he'd been grieving ever since um, Joseph disappeared. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father, Jacob, revived. Okay? And Israel said, I am convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Hallelujah. So we see there that Jacob was convinced. And that was Joseph's uh, aim all the while to make sure that his father was convinced that he could come because he knew how strongly Jacob was a man of covenant, you know. The Bible calls him, you know, just like the Bible talks about Abraham being the friend of God, uh, referred to um, God being the fear of Isaac. But when it came to Jacob, it refers to Jacob, I mean, to God being his shepherd. So Jacob knew, you know, he was strongly a covenant man. Remember, in his younger days, he did everything he could to be able to get the, um, the blessing from Esau. So he held it really dearly. So that's why... I believe Joseph went all the way to make sure that he convinced his father to uh, leave that land of promise, the land of covenant, and come to Egypt. So eventually he was convinced. Okay. So, I mean, we see how Joseph was a blessing to his family, you know, and how that he honored his father. He didn't just, oh, you know, just discount his him and his covenant, you know, his strong covenant um, belief. OK, he worked around it, coming, arriving at the point where he, he was able to convince Jacob to come over to Egypt. And in fact, if we read in the next chapter, we well, won't be able to go through that. God had to appear personally to Jacob in his dream to convince him again. In addition, in addition to all that had happened, even after this, God had to give him a dream to convince him to come into Egypt. Okay, and that and he he confirmed his promise 
that he was going to bring him back, that is, bring his generations back from Egypt, you know, so that he could inherit the land that he had given them, the land of Canaan. Okay, so we see here from the things that, you know, Jacob, Joseph sends to his father, you know, massive amount of stuff, 10 donkey loads of the best stuff from Egypt, you know, 10 female donkeys loaded with grains and bread and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he was a generous person, he was generous at heart, he was generous in his dealings, you know, with his family, honoring his father, you know, he took responsibility, okay? From the inside that God had given him, remember he shared it with his brothers before, that it was actually God that used them to send him ahead to be able to preserve them, okay? So he took that very seriously and acted. It wasn't just something that he believed just by words of mouth. He acted it out, okay? He accepted his, the, the obligations that came with, his, with the blessing of God upon his life to be able to preserve, to be able to take care of his family as well as taking care of, you know, Egypt and of course the rest of the world. Okay, now um, let's go to, let's jump to chapter 47 and we'll see verses 11 and 12. We see there, um, right, chapter 47, it says, So Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land the district of Ramesses, as Pharaoh directed in Goshen. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of their children. You know, that's important. Like you said, according to the number of their children. <laughs> you know, Joseph was a very um, good manager. So I don't think he believed in wastage. So he didn't just throw the things. He, he, he gave them what he needed according to the number of their children. So he took care of them basically. Remember the family was still on you know, and it was only the second year of the family. So five more years. So he took care of them. He settled them and made sure that they got food regularly as much as they needed. Okay. So we, we can see how uh, well Joseph did in executing that part of his responsibility. Now, Joseph was also an effective governor, okay? He set in place effective system, you know, of systems backed up by laws which proved to be effective governance. This is so important. Not only did he get the wisdom from God on how, you know, to, um, after he interpreted the dream, you know, on what to do, you know, uh, how to execute, you know, that interpretation, the wisdom from God, he set about doing it, you know, diligently storing up the food and so on and so forth. Now, when the time of the famine actually started, that's when you actually see another level of the wisdom with which Joseph operated. Because you see, it's not uncommon for people to have resources and squander them. Unfortunately, that's the story of many nations that we know of. Um, they have the resources, but they just squander the resources. It could have happened in, in Egypt, even though they had saved up all the during the seven years of abundance and so on, if there was not effective governance, which we show, which Joseph showed here, then they could have just squandered it. So maybe mid midway through the uh, seven years of farming, they would have run out of food. But we see here uh, from Genesis forty-seven. Let me read verses thirteen and six. Uh, it's a bit of a long one, but we need to see exactly how. This thing was um, executed. It says there was no food, however, in the whole region because the famine was severe. Both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for the grain that they were buying. And he brought it to Pharaoh's palace. So we see here, Joseph actually demonstrated, you know, a, 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 a shrewd way of doing business. It was an it was a shrewd businessman, okay? The Bible records that he brought all the money that was in Egypt and in Canaan, he brought it to Pharaoh. And here we see also that he was, you know, trustworthy. You know, he didn't keep part of it to himself. Remember, Pharaoh gave him the liberty to do whatever. He could have just, you know, pocketed the whole thing and not report everything, anything back to, to Pharaoh. But the Bible records here that he, you know, the, the, the payment, it says, 
verse 14. Let me read that again. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for the grain they were buying. Okay. And he brought it to Pharaoh's palace. He brought all the money to Pharaoh's palace. Verse 15. When the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, all Egypt came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? Our money is all gone. Okay, so that's the first day. Spent all the money. Then verse 16. Then Joseph said, okay, bring your livestock. Shrewd businessman. Uh, said Joseph, I will sell you food in exchange for your livestock since your money is gone. So <laughs> since there was no more money, he resorted to trade by butter. <laughs> You know, he took their livestock in exchange for the grains. Okay, so they brought their livestock to Joseph and he gave them food in exchange for their horses, their sheep and goats, their cattle and donkeys. And he brought them through that year with food in exchange for all their livestock. Okay, so now all their money is gone. All their livestock is gone. So the following year, when the year was over, they came to him the following year and said, we cannot hide from our Lord the fact that since our money is gone and our livestock belongs to you, there is nothing left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes? We and our land as well. Buy us and our land in exchange for food. And we with our land will be in bondage to Pharaoh, will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Give us seed so that we may live and not die and that the land may not become desolate. Verse 20, so Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, once and one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. The land became Pharaoh's and Joseph reduced the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to the other. However, he did not buy the land of the priests because they received a regular allotment from Pharaoh and had food enough for the, from the allotment Pharaoh gave them. That is why they did not sell their land. Joseph said to the people, now that I have bought you and your land today for Pharaoh, here is seed for you to, so you can plant the ground. But when the crop comes, when the crop comes in, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh, that's 20%. Does that ring a bell? 20% <laughs> taxation, income, <laughs> income tax. <laughs> but when the crop comes in, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. The, outer, the other four feats you may keep as seed for the fields and as food for yourselves and your households and your children. You have saved our lives, they said. May we find favor in the eyes of our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. So Joseph established it as a law concerning land in Egypt, still in force today. And I must say, it has influenced m most nations most uh, governments, world powers have operated by this law since that time. All, you know, traced back to Joseph, traced back to the wisdom that he had in saving uh, Egypt in that time. Now, the Israelites, okay, so still enforced today that a fifth of the produce belongs to Pharaoh. It was only the land of the priests that did not become Pharaoh's. So talking about governance, you see, we, as we've read, we can trace how, you know, I believe Joseph was constantly receiving wisdom from God on how to handle the situation. So that it won't be a case of midway through the famine, all the food is gone. Okay. But with wisdom, one year after the other, he kept releasing a different way, a different means. First of all, it was cash for the food. When they ran out of cash, both in Egypt and in Canaan, they ran out of cash. Then it was their life, livestock. When all that finished, another year. The next year, it was their fields and all their land. When all that, fi when everything now belonged to Pharaoh, then the next year he gave them seeds to be able to sow. And then, in fact, I'm sure it, it was better for them in the sense that now they had control. They were able to. It was it was more like a capitalist situation whereby even though they didn't own the land, own the land, they could sow their seeds. And out of uh, all the produce, they had the opportunity to be able to do whatever they wanted with uh, 80%. I mean, how cool is that? They could have ended up with nothing. But through this wisdom that God gave uh, Joseph, you know, they were able to, you know, end up still farming 
I mean, keeping 80%, and those ones who were wise amongst them, they will sow, re -sow the seed, eat part of it, and so on and so forth. So the whole nation came out, you know, um, not didn't perish during the famine. And of course, Pharaoh <laughs> became so rich. You know, all the land now belonged to Pharaoh. All the money from uh, Canaan and Egypt was brought to Pharaoh. I mean, he became stinking rich compared to when it started, when the famine started, simply because God gave one man. God gave Pharaoh dreams to reveal what was going to happen. And God gave one man, Joseph, the interpretation of the dream and the wisdom to be able to execute the plan and the wisdom to be able to execute that plan to make it happen. That way, he was able to save Egyptian economy, was able to save all the people, Egyptian people, he was able to save his own generation, you know, the, 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 the man of covenant that God had covenant with, you know, was able to save them simply because he was obedient to God, he was sold out to him, he was, he was, uh, he, he tapped into the kingdom of God and he, he stood in his place, okay, he stood in his place, he paid the price, you know, and then if we look in, um, so he set in place effective governance, he was trustworthy, he had integrity, he delivered all that money to Pharaoh, all right, so let's go on to, let's look at chapter 48, so we're just, like I said, we're just going to scan through bit by bit, chapter 48, Let's go to verse 12. So we see here that um, Joseph never stopped honoring his father. He never stopped honoring God. He never stopped honoring Pharaoh. Okay, he was a man of honor. And we see here that um, Joseph, seeing that Jacob was, you know, getting old and will soon die, he came to visit and you know, I'm sure Jacob must have told him how he he really, how the covenant, the blessing was so important to him. So Joseph brought his ch two children, Manasseh and Ephraim, so that Jacob could bless them, could release the blessing upon them. So we see here, um, chapter 48, verses 12 to 13, and then verse 20, we're going to read says, Then Joseph removed them, that is his children, from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. Okay, uh, it's, it is not uncommon for people to uh, despise the elderly ones, you know, the people who paid the price. We, that can happen with individuals, that can happen in family settings, it can also happen with nations where the elderly are, are they are not honored anymore, they are disdained, you know, they, 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 they are rubbished. As far as they are concerned, they could be done away with. But that is unrighteous, that's ungodly. You know, we need to honor our elderly people because they paid the price to keep us going, not only to bring us to the world, but also in their youth, they've worked, they've, they've labored, they've labored to sustain us, to sustain the nation. So as a nation, as a people, as a person, we need to honor the elderly people. So Joseph honored his father, brought his children so the father can bless them. He cherished the blessing from the elderly people. And in the same way as a people, we need to treat our elderly people very well, very nicely, so that they can release their blessing upon the nation. It is so important. A nation where um, the young ones don't honor the elderly ones, you know, it is dangerous. Okay, it is dangerous. So, um, uh, yeah, verse 12. Then Joseph removed them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim and Manasseh, Ephraim on his right hand, towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left hand, towards Israel's right hand, and brought them close to him. Now, this is very, um, well, as far as Joseph was concerned, it's important because in those days, there's something about the right hand. The right hand is a, uh, the place of power. You know, it, it's, it's spiritual. It is uh, biblical. You know, the one on your right hand, Bible talks about how the right hand is the right hand of power. So Joseph, knowing all these things, wanted his firstborn to be the one on the right hand. Okay, so that, you know, because remember, Jacob couldn't see very clearly here. Uh, but Jacob was led by the spirit. So he actually crossed his hands, you know, 
put the right hand, which is the right hand of power, the right hand of blessing, put it on, on uh, Ephraim, and then the left hand on Manasseh to release his blessings. Even though Joseph, in his proper, you know, protocol person, remember, he was a governor, everything has, has protocol. He, he tried to move the father's hands, but the father refused that that's exactly what he was going to do, what he was going to do. And then in verse 20, the Bible recalls that Jacob blessed them that day and said, in your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh and blessed them. He blessed them that they will multiply. They will become great. Okay. So Joseph honored the father even to the end. All right. And not only that, in showing that honor again, in if you jump to chapter 50, uh, verses 12 and 13 again. 50, 12 and 13. Now, when Jacob died, or before he died, he told Joseph that he wanted, the, the, they had to go and bury him in the place where his forefathers were buried, and that was in the land of Canaan. Okay, remember, he was reluctant to leave Canaan because that's, that's the place of promise, right? But he had to, God convinced him to come to Egypt and that he promised him that he was going to go back. So after his death, he told them they must, they must never bury him in Egypt and they must bury him in Canaan. So we see here, chapter 50, verses 12 and 13. So Jacob's sons did as he had commanded them. They carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which Abraham had bought along with the field as a burial place for Ephron the Hittite. So they buried him accordingly, you know, there. In honor, because you see, it's possible for people after the elderly ones are, are gone to not fulfill their wish, okay? But Joseph saw to it that it, it, they were honored to the last, you know. He honored Jacob, you know, to the last. They fulfilled his wish. Now, um, finally, I'm going to look at uh, verses 19 to 21 of the same um, chapter 50, okay? After they buried Jacob, Obviously, now Jacob wasn't there. So the other children of Jacob, they were scared. They were afraid again. Can you imagine? This is after 17 years. After 17 years. Maybe they felt, oh, the only reason that Joseph was being nice to them was because Jacob was there. But that's, that's not true, really, because he was already nice to them even before Jacob came on the scene. But in any case, you know, they were still afraid. They were scared. You know, so they went and prostrated themselves to Joseph again and said, please, um, we are your slaves, we are your servants, you know, that they should, should be kind to them. And it's recorded here that Joseph actually encouraged them again. Joseph encouraged them. He, he, he consoled them. He comforted them. It says here, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Can you see the humility of, you know, Joseph's heart, you know? saying to them, look, I'm not God. I am not God. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. So you had to go through the whole thing with them again, trying to encourage their hearts. You see, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. That is the salvation, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. So you can see that Joseph Joseph's heart was really completely permanently changed. It was full of kindness. It was full of, full of mercy. You know, he encouraged them, comforted them, even after his father had died, you know. And then if you jump down to verse 24, it says here, in fact, let me, let me just continue from that verse 20. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, a birth on Joseph's knees. So he saw, you know, third generation of his own children. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. That is verse 24. But God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land. To the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear on oath and said, 
God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. I mean, there was something about this covenant people. They believed so much in that promise that God gave them about Canaan that even though Joseph spent most of his life in Egypt, his destiny was attached to Egypt. He fulfilled that destiny. He still did not forget that covenant promise. That the land of promise is the land of Canaan. And he would, he never wanted his bones <laughs> to be missing from the land of promise. Okay. So anyway, he, uh, so Joseph died at the age of 110. And after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. And we read later on that when the children of Israel were uh, delivered, you know, in the time of Moses, they actually carried uh, Joseph's body with them. And it was when they got to Canaan that they went and buried it. I mean, how cool is that? You know, so Joseph was a man of honor. You know, he was a kind person up till the end. He served God. He served Pharaoh up till his death. You know, he fulfilled his destiny. He wasn't, he wasn't a, a shooting star whereby at the start he did everything right. And then he changed his ways, changed his mind. No, no, no. He was the same solid, rigid because of the relationship with God up till the end. He remained kind. He remained, you know, generous. You know, he, he honored God. He believed God that God cannot lie. The God who said he was going to deliver them and take them to that land of promise. He believed it so much so that he made them swear that they must carry his body with him. You know, I mean, with them when they are delivered. Okay, so he, he honored God. He honored his father in the sense that he ensured that the, he, his wish of his body being buried in Canaan was fulfilled. You know, he also honored Pharaoh in the sense that he didn't say, Oh, after the farming, then I've got to go now, please. Stayed there. That was the land of his major. That was the land of his destiny. And that's where he stayed. He lived. He settled. He served Pharaoh. He served God. He, 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 he took care of his family. He, he did everything that was required of him until he breathed his last and he died. So what, the encouragement I want to leave with us here is the fact that, look, once we find out what our major is, you know, with some people, I find, you know, um, maybe I've been in that session before as well. <laughs> when you know what God wants you to do, um, you're so nervous and so jittery, it's as though you get bored easily. That is the plague of this generation where everything is just fast, 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 fast food, microwave. That's the plague of the microwave generation. Easy to be bored, easy to become bored with doing the same thing. But you see, when God takes us to the land of our major, we're required to stay there, fulfill that destiny until, if he says, okay, it's time for you to move to another post, until then, and only if that happens, we stay at our call, we stay at our place, our place of, of um, destiny, the place of our major we stay in tune with God. We honor God. We, we honor whoever it is that's over us. We, we, we demonstrate the, the nature of God, the kindness, generosity, the love of God. We do as much as... I mean, it, it's not all the time that everything is going to be rosy to the end. I'm sure Joseph had his own uh, tough points even after he became the second in command. But the important thing is that we're where God has called us to be. And honoring God you know, uh, requires that we stay there. We continue to be a source of his wisdom, a source of his blessing. You know, we, we execute the project perfectly, you know, even up till now, the, the governance, governance, uh, structure, taxation and income, <laughs> income tax and, and all that Joseph brought in in Egypt is still influencing the world up till today. At least we know that, you know, in this country, we pay tax as well. You know, the basic level of tax is 20%, which is exactly the same as what uh, Joseph introduced. I believe he got that from God and he got it from, remember, you know, as, as a covenant person, he learned about tithing. The father must have taught him about tithing, 10%, giving 10% to God, you know, honoring God, acknowledging that God is the source. Okay. In the same way, this principle, he now brought it into governance, whereby now that all the land belongs to Pharaoh, <laughs> was a case of, well, the seed you're sowing, the land that you are, you are cultivating, 
everything belongs to Pharaoh anyway. So bringing 20% is nothing. So people gladly did it. And that's how we should gladly also honor God with our, our tithes and our offerings as well. Because it's not just giving it to somebody. It's showing gratitude to God, acknowledging that God is our source and honoring him with it. It's a matter of honor and it's a matter of our hearts as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining me for this series. And if you've been blessed, I want you to write a comment, you know, and I want you to share and uh, like and click the notification button. If you watch it on uh, YouTube, our YouTube channel is S-U-M-M-I-T Ministries International UK. If you watch it there, make sure you like it as well. Make sure you share it, leave a comment, click subscribe button and the bell button so you know when next we upload any other video. So this is the last installment tracking the life of Joseph from minor to major and we've learned quite a lot of things. So in your comments, let me know what you've learned. Let me know, you know, how it's impacted you or if maybe something that was left out. If you want to add something, then let me know, Let's share it. Okay. Do that also on YouTube if you watch it there. Well, I'm going to sign off now, but before I do that, I just want to say a quick word of prayer. Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to look into your word, to be able to see how you, you, you dealt with people in the word, in the Bible, and how that, because we know you are still the same God. You are still the same God of destiny. You are still the God who is able to take us from our minor place to our major place, to the place of our destiny. And Lord, the same thing that you did in the life of Joseph or other people that you, you've given us examples in the Bible, thank you because you're still able to do the same. You are still able to take us to our land of destiny. And there, as we fellowship with you, as we worship you, as we serve you with all of our hearts, thank you because God, our lives will have impact on so many, on so many. Help us, oh God, to be generous of heart, to be kind, Lord, to be, to be, uh, uh, not, not, not to be selfish, but to be, to be, you know, forward looking, outward looking, looking to be a blessing. Because God, when you bless us, when you put us in a place of blessing, it is for, for us to be a blessing to others. Not just for us to enjoy the blessing, but Lord, we are blessed to be a blessing. That is, Lord, one of the things that you, you, you've ordained for us as children of covenant. Help us to be conversant of that. I pray your blessing, O oh God, on everyone that watches this at whatever point. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And for those that don't know you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, now is the time for you to receive him into your heart because that is when he can take your hands and take you to your place of major and you execute it in honor of God and to his glory and to his blessing. All you need to do is acknowledge that you can't save yourself, put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to do that. And then you become a child of God. Okay. God bless you and I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye for now.